up after the CCP conducted one of the largest military drills ever near Taiwan just last week. This is very disturbing. And Congressman, I want to get your take on where all of this weaponry stands, because I know that you had discussions about readiness. Uh, is Taiwan ready for a potential blockade? Well, in many ways, Congressman, it's been predictable. I mean, you think about Brazil. There was a recent election. Um, the Biden administration uh, was cheering on Lula to win, the leftist who has now aligned himself with China, um, if not some people say potentially interfering with that election. But let's just say they were just cheering on that election. Ordered and bought, paid for 22 weapons at least that I know of that are supposed to go to Taiwan. How come they have not received it? And what are you going to do in terms of trying to get more aggressive to get that weaponry to Taiwan? And yet they knew, had to know, that he would, that Lula would align with China and that that would be bad for America. What the heck is going on with the Biden um, State Department and with the Biden administration in general? They're practically handing Latin America over on a silver platter and China, to China, and China's gobbling up resources and interfering with this hemisphere. As the GOP House Foreign Affairs members were on the ground in Taiwan meeting with Taiwanese officials. China's show of bravado coming after Taiwan's president visited the United States, meeting with House Speaker Congressman Kevin McCarthy. We saw it when Putin invaded uh, Ukraine, and now we're seeing it with Chairman Xi threatening Taiwan and the Pacific Islands. He knows that the Chinese Communist Party is infiltrating his country in the same way that they're working in American universities. He knows that they've stolen billions of dollars worth of French intellectual property in the way they have stolen tens of billions of dollars of American intellectual property. Uh, President Trump's plenty, plenty smart enough to know that this coming confrontation, not brought on by the United States, brought on by Xi Jinping in China, this coming confrontation is real and serious, and neither France nor broader Europe will escape this threat, and we're going to have to figure out a way to confront it together. China, their alliance with Putin, their alliance with Iran, now the Saudis have, have chosen sides. They, they're now going with China and Russia and Iran, and you see the world disintegrating killer satellites, nuclear missiles. You think they're building all that to defeat Taiwan? They're building all that to defeat us. They're not going to be satisfied with Taiwan. They're in battles now with the Philippines and Japan, even Vietnam. Uh, Australia's being threatened. Uh, unless you're Helen Keller, you can't see this and hear what's going on here. This is a big damn deal. And let me tell you something that viewers of this audience and others may not want to hear. We need to prepare for war against China. I don't mean go to war. I don't mean initiate a war. But they are preparing for war. We are completely unprepared as a nation psychologically. We are completely unprepared economically and immigration-wise in securing our border. Our military is not prepared in the sense that they're pushing this woke ideology. Our military budgets do not reflect the threats that we are facing in the world around us. I want to say it again, so the backbenchers regurgitate it. We must prepare for war against China. And look what this bastard does to us, the president of France. He goes over to China at the height of tensions, stabs us in the back, says he will not support us. He's provoking the Chinese to act, talks about autonomy. You can stick your autonomy, France, as far as I'm concerned. And you can also see the profound power of our alliances in today's united NATO. Since Russia's invasion of Ukraine, we further strengthen NATO's defense and deterrence on its eastern flank. And congressional leadership on the European Deterrence Initiative and our investments since 2014 helped us react quickly and boldly to Russia's cruel war of choice and made our deterrence even stronger. In sum, Mr. Chairman, this, this is the budget that will meet this moment, and I respectfully ask for your support. The single most effective way that this committee can support the department and our outstanding troops is with an on-time full-year appropriation. So I look forward to working with everyone so that we can continue to defend our democracy and support the forces of freedom in this hour of challenge.
Well, good morning, everyone on the east and west coast of the United States and everybody. Good afternoon in the United, well, United Kingdom and all of Europe. And good evening to everyone from Asia. Thank you for joining the program. You saw the intro. Hmm. Let's get right into it. We have Alexander Christoforu, Alexander Makuris, Cyrus Jansen, and myself, Alex, Reportify Media. Gentlemen, um, let's start with you, uh, Cyrus. Pretty disturbing little intro there, I think. Yeah, you know, it's just interesting. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm here in the United States, and the big story is Macron and, you know, France. And, and this is really an interesting one because th this is really something that I've been really advocating for a long time. And it's, it's the fact that in, in the United States is we have this, we're very much a bully on the international scene. And we see that even with our closest allies. And this is an interesting thing because I'm an American that lived abroad for 15 years. And I really advocate that on the world have to act in their best interest. And even if you are a United States ally, for example, I lived in Canada, your home country, Alex, for the last mm -hmm. five years. And, you know, I, I said, Canadians, you know, you have to follow the best thing for Canada. You know, you're, you I mean, we look at the whole Meng Wanzhou thing and that whole, that whole trial that, that really dragged Canada right in between the middle of the United States and China, you know, was that in the best interest of Canada? You know, or are they just, or are, are they just acting, you know, to please the Americans? You know, I remember when I went to the courthouse that day, I asked the police officers there and they're like, look, you know, we're, but who want me to tell it to you straight? We're doing Donald Trump's dirty work for him. You know, that's, that's mm -hmm. what I feel about this trial. And I don't like it because as a Canadian, I don't want to just blindly follow the United States wherever they go. I mean, you look at France taking a stand and it's the same thing. You know, I mean, the United States is going to blast anybody, especially our allies, if they don't follow suit. But, you know, we're, we're living in a multipolar world and it's changing very, very fastly day by day. Well, let's uh, move over to the geopolitical experts. I'll call uh, my friends here at the Duran. Um, I'm Alexander Makuras. i um, been watching a lot of your videos the last few weeks here and I've been noticing a lot more people have been viewing them as well. Uh, what's your take on this current geopolitical situation that's going on? Well, it seems to me that people in the United States are getting ever more hysterical. They're getting into a situation where they're talking themselves into a completely unnecessary war, unnecessary in any understanding of the real interests of the United States with China. And, you know, let's just unpack some of the things that we heard in that introduction, you know, that we need to increase the budgets. I think it was... Hannity said, you know, that our, you know, the US military budget isn't adequate enough to cope with China. The, the US military budget is by far the biggest in the world. It's far bigger than China's. It's far bigger than China's and Russia's combined. How much more money do you need? And secondly, this extraordinary reaction to those comments that Macron made in that interview he gave with Politico. Now, can I just say, if you've been following Macron, as I have done for many years, you will know that he comes up every so often with these kind of comments, you know, about France for needing, you know, to pursue strategic autonomy, Europe needing to pursue strategic economy, uh, autonomy. He talked once about NATO being brain dead. He's talked about the need for new security architectures in Europe. He comes up with these great phrases. They never really mean anything because he is never able to translate them into actual concrete policies. And anybody who knows Macron understands this. And yet the US hears a few words like this from the French president, who's never, as I said, acted on any of this. And they become utterly hysterical. They become furious. You saw, I think it was Hannity getting really worked up about what <laughs> Macron was saying. I mean, you know, Macron, for goodness sake, I mean, you know, hardly a person who's going to change the global balance in any kind of effective way. So they're getting themselves worked up over a conflict with China. And what is the cause of this conflict? It's not Taiwan. Let's be very clear about this. The conflict between the United States and China is not about Taiwan. The United States recognizes Taiwan as part of China. That is still official US policy. So when people talk about you know, the Chinese threats to Taiwan, it's officially a Chinese so-called threat 
a part of China is supposedly threatening another part of China. In fact, the reality is it's got nothing to do with Taiwan. The problem is that China has risen. It's become the great economic superpower. Its industrial base is greater than that of the United States. Its manufacturing capacity is greater than that of the United States and Europe combined. Its economy is growing, uh, I think, three to five times the speed that the United States is achieving at the moment this year. And that's what spooked the United States. It's had this long history experience going all the way back to the 19th century of being the world's biggest economic power, richest country. It's had the important experience since the Second World War of being the world's most powerful military country. And it is afraid that for the first time, that top spot is being lost to another country and is specifically an Asian country. And that seems to be making some people in the United States, not just some people, a lot of people in the United States go mad. Well, let's uh, before we shift over to uh, Alex Christoforou, uh, I wanted to mention on that starting clip at the start there, um, that was uh, Lloyd Austin right at the end there, the United States Secretary of Defense. Uh, he was uh, basically cap in hand trying to increase the military budget to $842 billion. The other interesting thing is, is um, that I picked up on that is when he mentioned that our investment in Ukraine since 2014, interesting point where he starts the clock, and then he says our investment to continue to support NATO uh, for what? I thought NATO really wasn't involved in this conflict. Alex Christopher, you're the expert at this stuff. I'm going to hand it over to you to try to unpack this. Well, they've dug themselves in, in a hole, haven't they? This didn't have to happen. None of this had to happen, but it has because the neocons are, are running things. They had an opportunity to follow the Minsk agreements, multiple opportunities, to, uh, to follow the Minsk agreements, to push the Poroshenko government and then the uh, Zelensky government to enforce the Minsk agreements. They didn't. They had the opportunity to have Zelensky say that Ukraine was going to, to remain neutral. They, uh, they didn't do that. And so they decided that it was time for uh, a proxy war with Russia and they pushed Russia into this conflict after multiple warnings from, uh, from President Putin, over eight years of warnings from the Russian government, we ended up in a conflict with uh, Ukraine, the United States, the collective West. They, uh, they started a proxy war with Ukraine. And now this proxy war with Ukraine has morphed into what I see will be, uh, I don't want to say inevitable, but it seems like that's where we're heading towards a conflict between the United States and China. And they're going to say it's over Taiwan. They'll say it's over a number of other things. But this is this is without a doubt. Uh, to me, this is a Th Thucydides trap. It's it's the hegemon deciding that they're not going to go go away quietly into the night. They are going to fight and go to war with the rising power, and that rising power is China with Russia. And so instead of opting for, for a multipolar world, instead of divorcing from China, which was Trump's plan, we gotta, we gotta remember that Trump, he wanted a type of divorce from China and, and he wanted to have a world where the United States was trying to compete toe to toe with China, whether that was going to be successful or not, who knows, but he was trying to, to create this type of type of divorce with China where they're not enemies, but they are adversaries. We've moved past that. And now we're in a Thucydides trap scenario. The United States now has no other option but to go after Russia and China, because if they don't go after Russia and China, well, then they're going to lose their status as, as the unipolar power. And they, they, they obviously are not uh, prepared to accept that. At least the neocons are not prepared to accept that. But we didn't have to get to this point. This could have all been prevented. But 
the U.S. and the neocons, they've bogged down the U.S. and the collective West in Ukraine, and now they're going to bog them down in, uh, in China. I mean, you know, Cyrus, you're the ambassador of peace. I've seen that many times in the comment section here. I mean, is there a way out of this? Well, I, I don't, I don't think so because I, I just, I really, it's, it's interesting because, you know, here in the United States, we have a, a very high level of propaganda, and there's only one message that is being sent out to American people, and it is always that China is the aggressor, China is doing this, China is doing that. But we have to remember, you know, we have a a, a two party uh, system here in America, but in reality, we actually only have one. Uh, because it doesn't matter if it's Democrats or Republicans that are in charge. Uh, I mean, honestly, the U.S. election really doesn't matter because it's the military industrial complex that runs this country. So in many ways, we actually do have a one party state because that is who is the driving force behind every decision that gets made in America. Mm -hmm. And I remember last year when the budget was getting, you know, closer and closer to being finalized. Uh, you know, they, they wanted to push through more weapon sales and more military spending. And that's when you saw the U.S. general said, I think we're going to war with Taiwan in 2025. And, and it's like, what, what is that based on? Well, it's my gut feeling. You know, it's like, OK, great. So now we're making foreign policy decisions based on some random guys, you know, gut feeling. You know, there's no intelligence that says this. There's no evidence that would suggest this. But all of a sudden, now all, all our all our congressmen are saying, well, based on this general's gut feeling, let's go ahead and raise that budget. And they did it. They raised the budget. They were able to spend more. And it's and it's just there's so much money being made with the military industrial complex. And, and this is this lie that's being sold that, hey, China wants to come in and they want to destroy America. That That is China's goal, which is, you know, anybody that studies China knows that's that's just we look at the his simple history. I mean, China's China's not. Um, uh, you know, they are not forceful with their military. They certainly have built up a, a very large military. But, um, you know, that's what superpowers do. If you are a world superpower, you're going to build up a military. Um, mm. and, and it's, and it's just very interesting to be here in the United States and, you know, try to reason with people and, and just say, well, when's the last time that China was involved in a war? When's the last time that China went and attacked a country? But we see this hysteria here. I mean, we saw the Chinese spy balloon, you, you know, I've seen certain anti-China YouTubers come out and say, well, what if China decided to strap a nuclear bomb to that and just start bombing the United States? It's like, again, what, 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 what would provoke them? What, what's the reason behind that? We need to, you know, we need to just dial this back to just some basic thinking here and, and some basic problem solving skills. And I don't see that in America. You know, it's just pushing this forward. But again, I think we need to go to the root causes here. And again, it's the military industrial complex that keeps pushing and pushing and pushing. And unfortunately, there's just so many Americans that have zero clue of what's really going on in the world and, and uh, unfortunately they just have turned into this very negative image of china and it's like oh you know xi jinping wants to destroy us no he doesn't he has no interest to destroy um, the united states and in, in fact i mean china needs a very uh, china and the united states relationship is very important for both countries you know that's the ironic thing even in 2022 we, we sold 256 sorry the united states bought 256 billion dollars worth of products from china I mean, our economy depends on China. I mean, it's just it's just absolutely ludicrous when you actually understand these things and start breaking them down. But unfortunately, most Americans aren't there. Uh, Cyrus, before I, we're going to move on to Alexander Makuras, but I'm going to put this slide up on the uh, show here. And this slide is basically showing the U.S. military presence around the world. There are 750 bases in over 80 countries, 173,000 troops deployed in 159 countries. Uh, whereas the U.S. bombed since World War II, there's 36 countries on the, that uh, list right now. Uh, Mr. McCurris, I mean, unpack that for us. I mean, are we going to war here? Well, I mean, the language that is coming out of the United States does, in fact, point to the fact that the United States is going to war with China. And can I just go back to the things that Cyrus was saying? Why would China want to attack the United States? China knows that the United States is a nuclear superpower. China knows that the United States is one of its biggest markets, if not its biggest market. China also knows that its economy is growing faster than that of the United States, and in manufacturing terms, is already much bigger than that of the United States. Everything points, you're assuming a rational Chinese leadership, and everything about the Chinese leadership sh shows that it is extremely rational. 
everything points to a Chinese leadership not seeking war with the United States. It doesn't make any conceivable sense for China to seek war with the United States. And Cyrus is absolutely right. If you look at Chinese history, China has never sought war. It's never been a particularly belligerent country at any time in its history. If you take an interest, as I, by the way, do in Chinese painting, China has a huge history in painting. You will notice that scenes of war scarcely ever a picture appear in Chinese paintings. They are very, almost entirely, scenes of peaceful life. So it's a, it's a society that values peace. Peace has worked well for China. Contrast that with the United States. And of course, you point to this extraordinary history of the United States, the fact that it's conducted wars in, I, I mean, I forget how many countries, in how many places, how many bases it has around the world. We've talked about its enormous military budget. Cyrus spoke about the enormous power of its military industrial complex. China has nothing comparable. There's nothing comparable to the military industrial complex the United States has in China. China has obviously large military industries, but they are controlled directly by the Chinese government. Chinese, well, you see the B-52 there dropping bombs. When has China ever done anything similar to that at any point in its modern history? It hasn't. So we have this enormously aggressive response to the rise, the peaceful rise, the economic, primarily economic and social rise of China from a society whose leadership and um, system has become extremely militarized and profoundly aggressive. Um, let's go over to Alex uh, Christoforou. Um, you did a video a few days ago about Le Pen's comment about NATO here uh, and its involvement in the Ukraine, saying that she made a, a tweet saying that if um, the Ukraine succeeded in this uh, conflict against, uh, against Russia, that it's definitely that NATO is involved. Yeah. Yeah, and she's right. I mean, <laughs> she's right. I mean, I, I don't think there's any doubt that if if Ukraine were to succeed in in this spring offensive, whenever this spring offensive will be, end of end of April is what I'm hearing, uh, middle of May, uh, if they were to succeed, no doubt that NATO played or will play a big role in it. I think that's that's obvious. But you know, John Bolton he wrote an article in the Wall Street Journal a couple of days ago, and he said. We need to have a global NATO. Forget about uh, a European NATO. We need to create a global NATO because once we're done tearing apart Russia, is what Bolton said, once we're done tearing apart Russia, we need to focus on uh, on taking care of China. And, and that is the problem. The problem that we have in, in front of us is that according to neocon doctrine, neocon policy, you cannot have another country rise to power. It's impossible. It goes against their doctrine, their ideology. It goes, every, it goes against everything they stand for. It doesn't matter if they have to destroy the way, uh, the way life is in the United States, if they have to destroy the U.S. economy. It doesn't matter if they have to destroy the European economy, which is what, what they've done. It doesn't matter if they have to blow up pipelines. It doesn't matter. According to neocon doctrine, you cannot have another country or a group of countries rising up to challenge the power of the hegemon. And, and that is where we are. We are we are in a position right now where the United States is run by neocons, starting with Joe Biden. Even if Biden is out of it and he's in, in, in cuckoo land, he is still a neocon at heart. He always has been a neocon. His 50 years in government, in the Senate, he has been a neocon. And he surrounded himself with neocons. Trump surrounded himself with neocons, and it did a lot of damage to the Trump White House. Well, now we have neocons running the government from top to bottom. And, and for them, the only way forward is conflict. We heard Hannity, we heard uh, 
uh, all the other uh, people on on Fox News and all the other analysts, you know, who's this Macron guy to to say anything? <laughs> you know, Macron, how dare you? How dare you have an opinion? Yeah. How dare you an announce a policy that that goes against our wishes? Yeah, I mean, it is disturbing, um, but to see the U.S. media really ramping up here over the last, I would say, one in three stories that are coming out uh, on the news wires are focused on conflict with China. It's like they're about to pivot uh, away from the Ukraine. Now, whether this story is is dying down, um, here's something else that hit the headlines this week. I'm sure you're all aware of it. Uh, or last week, it was the Pentagon Pentagon document leaks. Now, I have managed to um, view uh, a few, we'll say, of these documents. Uh, I won't be putting the link in the description for this where to uh, find them, but uh, most of you uh, cyber sleuths shouldn't have any problems uh, locating them. Um, they're, I've, been, I've seen them out there on Twitter, but um, I did visit the Wikipedia uh, page about this, and uh, it is pretty damaging. Now, everyone knows that the Americans do spy on a lot of countries. They know that, so there's nothing new here. Uh, somebody should have let that gentleman know that he should have had a phone call with Edward Snowden before he did this, mm -hmm. uh, because he probably would have been uh, in a safer position. Uh, in these documents, though, it is quite damaging. Um, it did contain over 100 pages. Uh, it was a lot of it was uh, charts, graphs, uh, a lot of intelligence documentation. Um, as I go into it, they did make comments on the Battle of Bakhmut as well, uh, pretty much siding with uh, what the Wagner Group was saying, what was going on there. Uh, I'm not sure where they're getting their information from, but uh, probably a credible source. Now, here's something else I want to uh, just uh, bring to the attention of our viewers today. If you try to look on the internet for casualty estimates in this conflict, you're going to be coming up with pretty much nothing. Um, the numbers are all over the place. Somebody, some some uh, documents and news articles are saying as low as 4,000 people dead in this entire era. Well, we know that that's not true. Uh, we have a good friend, Patrick Lancaster, that can definitely tell you that that's not the case. Um, but they are saying here with the, the U.S. provided military information that these numbers uh, are much greater than they thought in deaths for um, the, the Ukrainian side. But they made an, a rather disturbing uh, comment. And let me read it to you guys and we'll carry on to you in a moment, Cyrus. A yeah. defense intelligence agency analyst discovered in the leak found that peace talks between the U.S. and Russia are unlikely, uh, even if the Ukraine is able to amount unsustainable losses. Interesting comment there on Russian forces. Previous documents show that the U.S. intelligence does not believe Ukraine can yield significant gains with their counteroffensive. And it goes on to talk about, uh, you know, the relationships with uh, Serbia and South Korea. One other comment I want to make here says the document shows how the U.S. sought to pressure Israel into providing lethal aid. Israel has previously denied the Ukraine weaponry, including its uh, Iron Dome and air defense system. And to round it off, uh, the usual suspects are on there, Canadian, the United Kingdom, uh, Australia, the Collective West, of course. And uh, the Department of Defense uh, was using some of this data to increase the military budget to the tune once again of $842 billion. Cyrus, back. the ball is back in your court, sir. Yeah, I mean, it's an interesting development. Uh, I mean, it's just... We just can say I, I wanted to kind of follow up. I wanted to share one other thing that I saw as as we're seeing, um, you know, this this multipolar world that we're going into, and and just how lost we are in the United States. I saw a news clip from Marco Rubio, Senator Marco Rubio, from my mm -hmm. home state of Florida, and it was very interesting because as soon as uh, you know, we know Brazil's President Lula is in you know Beijing. You know, he's in a very long visit there, and it was interesting. You know, as soon as that deal was announced that Brazil and China are going to be trading in a different currency, uh, I mean, it was it was hilarious to watch Rubio because he said, you know, this again 
is in our hemisphere. You know, this is Brazil, one of the largest economy here, uh, you know, basically um, implying, you know, this is our backyard, you know, China's doing this deal. And he said, you know, the problem with this is, you know, we're not, you know, what's going to happen to the US dollar in a few years, we're not going to be able to sanction anybody because our <laughs> currency is going to be so devalued. I mean, do you know what this means? Like, where are we, you know, sanctions aren't going to mean anything anymore. And it was just hilarious how, he didn't realize like this is what has, you know, the sanctions against Russia and the fact that it's not the majority of the world. I mean, the majority of the world do not support these sanctions. And, you know, they're against sanctions against Iran. They're against, uh, I mean, we, you know, we have sanctioned Cuba for decades, you know, I mean, and that's just 90 miles from the United States border. And so there's a lot of people that aren't happy about these sanctions. And, and yet we're just in this echo chamber. Uh, and it's just amazing how Marco Rubio on national television is just spewing this and not realizing, you know, what caused the whole thing. And uh, it's just, again, it's, it's just this, uh, this ability to not really understand what's going on in these events. Now, going with the Russia-Ukraine uh, situation, I mean, again, we've had Patrick Lancaster many times on the show uh, providing us a very interesting insight into, you know, this very complicated situation. And it's, and it's hard to understand, you know, really, you know, who's winning this war? What is going on? I mean, these documents are, are quite, quite revealing, right? You know, there just definitely shows a different... Uh, different side that you know there is some doubt from the United States is you know if Ukraine can win this conflict and you know how how well how good is this war really going for Ukraine you know I mean and I think at this point I mean it's certainly I'm one for always trying to find a ceasefire and trying to find an end to this as soon as possible I know that China's put forward a peace plan uh, but I mean it's it's just it, it's just ludicrous to keep funding this and I'm and I'm starting to see this change in the United States where a lot of people are really I mean, we're, we're realizing just how much money we are endlessly pouring to Ukraine. Meanwhile, mm -hmm. I mean, you know, if you're on the West Coast, I mean, you look at every single major city here. I mean, it is just becoming it's becoming unlivable. I mean, you go to Seattle, Portland, San Francisco, L.A., homeless cities dominate drug epidemic. I mean, it is an absolute war zone and it's a disaster. It's an absolute disaster. And, uh, you know, I did I did. I'll end on this point. I did see one really good article that came out. Um, and it was a, it was somebody that I forgot the author, but he wrote a New York Times opinion piece saying, you know, how can we win this war with with uh, China? And I read it, you know, uh, thinking it was going to be very negative, but he actually had a very positive. And he said, you know, the biggest thing that we can do is we got to focus on improving America. You know, we need to basically stop this nonsense and start looking in the mirror and looking at all the disasters that are happening in America right now. And, you know, why don't we try to make our nation better first? I'm like, well, fantastic. Like, that's it's a great opinion piece. Like, that's exactly what the United States should be doing like, instead of all this nonsense. But I don't know if that's going to happen at all. Because <laughs> let's keep you on the screen there, Cyrus. I'm going to play uh, a little bit of this Rubio chat, and uh, we can comment a little bit more on it here. Let's uh, see if you guys can hear this. In our hemisphere, largest country in the Western Hemisphere, south of us, cut a trade deal with China. They're going to from now on do trade in their own currencies, get right around the dollar. They're creating a, a secondary economy in the world, totally independent of the United States. We won't have to talk about sanctions in five years. Because there'll be so many countries transacting in currencies other than the dollar that, that we won't have the ability to sanction them. As, as we are sitting here, you know, focused on some of these nuttiness that's going on, people that are basically dedicating their lives in this country to ensuring that it is legal to mutilate children, to do drag shows in schools, they, they dedicate their lives to this. And we have a, 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 a another superpower that basically wants to become the world's dominant power at our expense. And these people don't want to focus on it. They're, you know, we had a, some person on the view yesterday say that our criminal justice system is no better than what China So basically Rubio as you were saying Cyrus is saying that look hey if uh if we pull back from this we're we're in trouble uh we won't have the weapon of sanction anymore um we're out of bullets on that one uh they've they pulled the European Union into well attempting to try to block 300 billion and this is where I'm going to go to Alex Christoforou about this because you spoke about this yesterday that uh you know the EU and the US are not having much success in in grabbing this money even though they say they have it well Bloomberg actually said that uh, they've only managed to come up with something like around 28 billion or 38 billion I forgot the number but out of this 300 billion they've managed to locate 28 or 38 billion I mean, we've done shows, me and Alexander, on, on this very topic. And I think we both come to the conclusion that this money is probably back in Russia. The Russians aren't saying anything. I think the Russians are deliberately not saying anything because they like to see the collective West just kind of, you know, chase after their, their own tails. And the money is 
you know, I don't want to say it's gone, but it's <laughs> not where they thought it was. And a lot of people say, how, how, how is this possible? How can you hide money in today's world? We have all of the digital stuff and, and all the surveillance. Yes, you can hide money today. You can make money disappear, even in today's world. You know, that's, that, that's why you have very good accountants. They know how to move money around. And I think that, that the Russians, even though they're not saying anything, and I could be wrong, maybe this money will show up somewhere, but I think this money is, is back, back home, back in Russia in one form or another. If, if they knew where this money was, they would have gotten to this money already. They mm -hmm. would have had this money many, many months ago, many months ago. But the problem is, is that they don't know where this money is. So now they're saying there's legal issues and we can, we're having some stumbling blocks here and some regulations there. That's nonsense. You also if they knew where this money was, they would have, they would have pocketed this money already. Mm -hmm. Sorry to cut it. you off there. I just wanted to add something because you also uh, made a comment in uh, that same video about the money and it really touched, uh, you know, um, uh, put a firecracker off in my brain because, you know, spending almost two decades in Monaco, getting to understand how the offshore business worked and how a lot of these companies are put together. It's not like you walk into a Monaco bank and you just say, OK, I've got a company. I've just formed it. It's basically, you know, let's pick the board of directors. Where are your board of directors? Well, they're going to be in Panama. The Panama are then going to open up in a jurisdiction like the BVI. The BVI then is going to circle back and stop in Jersey, the Channel Islands, to get a trust behind it. The trust then hides the beneficial owner. The, that is the key to then the bank accounts go open. It could be, uh, you know, some babushka from uh, Siberia who's uh, the head of the, uh, the company. Uh, and the bank account is sitting in another jurisdiction. Absolutely right. Uh, they may think that they have it, but uh, Alex, uh, continue on. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off about that. No, no, I, I agree with you. And, and I spent a lot of time in Cyprus, which is also a country which, which is full of accountants that know how to move money around, as does the city of London, as do the, the accountants in, in New York. I mean, they know how to move money around. If they want to disappear money, they can make it happen. I mean, we had the, the, the president or the prime minister of Afghanistan just a couple of years ago, he left the country with suitcases full of cash, suitcases. We have the revelations from Seymour Hirsch that, that the Zelensky regime is pocketing somewhere around 400 uh, million just from diesel fuel, yeah, just from was, last year. I read that, so, yeah. You know, I mean, you know, the fact that they can't get to the 300 billion and this money is probably somewhere back in Russia and the Russians are not mm -hmm. saying anything doesn't surprise me. But it's embarrassing mm -hmm. for for Yellen and mm -hmm. for Ursula and, and all of these Extremely. people. Yeah. And, and to add to that, you know, uh, we spoke on one of your live streams prior to this about the uh, Monaco Battalion, where 84 individuals from the Ukraine, multimillionaires, uh, were under investigation by the SBI in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. Uh, but what ended up happening in the end of there is there were no convictions, except the only one person that was charged was the journalist that reported it. So, uh, yeah, back over to you, Alexander McCurris. Well, I mean, there's a, a lot of things to say. I mean, first of all, can I just say, just, just for the record, that the central bank, the Russian central bank, has just announced its total foreign, foreign currency reserves, gold and foreign currency reserves, $600 billion now. They were six hundred and thirty billion dollars when the war uh, started. So wow. um, they're they're back almost to where they were when the war started, and they're growing, by the way. So that's just to round that off. Now I wanted to go back to some of the things that Cyrus was saying. He was talking about this article about how the best way to beat China is to um, improve America, and. Um, some of the things that, of course, Mark Rubio, Marco Rubio was saying, you know, that, you know, we've got to, you know, Brazil is doing all of these deals with China. That is absolutely terrible and it's really bad for us. This is all very dangerous thinking, including actually that article. Improving America, making life better for the American people is something that the US government ought to prioritize. Competing with China is not the reason to do it. The reason you do it is because your own people should be your primary first 
concern. The same thing goes <laughs> about Brazil. Uh, you know, if Brazil wants to do deals with China and wants to pay, you know, in you know, wants to pay for these in RMB yuan or whatever. Well, that's a matter for Brazil. It's not really something that the United States should get worked up about. It's not losing the whole of South America because Brazil is doing deals with China. These zero-sum games, this thinking that if other countries do well, if China does well, if Brazil does well through trading with uh, China, this is somehow bad for the United States, is re-leading the United States into this extraordinary mad situation where they feel that they have to get themselves into some kind of a conflict with, uh, with, with China because the, it makes a positive thing, the fact that countries are trading with each other, that they are becoming more prosperous into a negative and threatening one instead of seeing it as an opportunity for the United States to benefit as well. Now, on the Duran, a few days ago, we did a program on Sunday, with which was, it was published on Sunday, with the uh, um, former Indian ambassador to Russia. It's a very interesting program. He had much to say. He had many things to say about China, not all of which, by the way, after all, he is the Indian ambassador, Chinese people might necessarily agree, but he did make one point, which I thought was extremely interesting. He said multipolarity is going to happen. It's only a question of time. There's nothing that the United States can do, start, short of starting a nuclear holocaust, that can prevent it. He said the problem is that a few years ago, we all believed, we includes India as well, by the way, we all believed that it would be a negotiated multipolarity. Instead, because of the policies of the United States, it is becoming a contested one. And that, the Indian ambassador, the former Indian ambassador made clear, is the root of the problems in the international system today. That the United States, instead of accepting that, you know, you can't remain the dominant power forever, you know, until for the indefinite future and, you know, until, you know, who knows what will happen, you know, in a millennium time. Instead of accepting that that is impossible, it can't be sustained. It wants to try to freeze everything at where, not so much it is now, but where it was 20 years ago. And that's impossible. It cannot be done. But it is pushing us all headlong towards confrontation and a headlong confrontation with the country that is rising most, which has risen most, which is, of course, China, which is, on any objective analysis, both unnecessary and potentially disastrous for the United States as well. Now, I wanted to say a few things about Ukraine. I don't want to talk too long. I'll just say this. The conflict in Ukraine also ultimately is about China. There was, if you tracked the articles that were appearing in the various neocon journals in the first months of the Biden administration, you could see that there was an extraordinary article in the Atlantic Council from some anonymous person, apparently within the administration. Xi Jinping is the, you know, the most evil man on earth. China is this terrible adversary. We've got to break this alliance between the Chinese and the Russians. The way we should do it is through seeking some kind of concessions, gate winning the Russians over by making concessions to them. And then you had another article, more articles further on, including a culminating one by uh, a former State Department official, Mr. Wes Mitchell, which appeared in the national interest. It's been much edited, in my opinion, since I first read it. It said, no, we can't make any concessions to the Russians. We've got to arrange their defeat in Ukraine and then once we've defeated them, we can impose our 
perspectives on them and redirect Russia into hostility towards China. And that article, by the way, appeared in August 2021. So th th this is the kind of thinking that you, you end up creating wars, creating a war in Ukraine, which is going wrong, creating a future war in Taiwan, all in order to preserve a system, an anomalous system, an unusual system, an abnormal system in which one power the United States was preeminent and which cannot continue forever. Yeah, I think it's quite troubling. I mean, we, when I first came on your guys' show about five, six months ago, I wouldn't think that I would be talking about this topic, uh, you know, with conflict here with America and China. But, uh, you know, judging by, you know, watching hours and hours of these uh, meetings that they have in the United States, the congressional meetings, the House meetings, you know, the Senate talks about armed forces. I mean, that meeting with Lloyd Austin, uh, you know, the Secretary of Defense lasted over three hours. And they were just going through it toe by toe. It wasn't about should we prepare for it? Should we get the budget for it? Is no, we're going to get it because we need it because, well, this is what our plans are. If anybody wants to really dive into seeing what uh, this aggressive country, and I'm going to call it for what it is, it's aggressive. I mean, the statistics are there. Uh, it's been in 36 uh, uh, bombing campaigns uh, since the Second World War. No surprise, uh, military industrial complex here. But the issue is, is that when and uh, how this is all going to happen and can it be avoided? Right now, um, listening to these meetings, uh, you will see, actually, uh, I was so, uh, you know, bemused by watching it uh, this morning that I did put a link in my description of the entire three hours. And it, you watch it and there's no denying that this is the path that they think uh, is the right path to go, and that's with a military conflict. I'm um, going to go to uh, Alex, uh, Alex Christoforou. I mean, Alex, we've talked about this uh, many of times uh, about this, you know, conflict uh, with Taiwan. I mean, watching your program, I now see and understand the bridge that the Americans are trying to bring here to China. It's pretty clear. Yeah, they, they've dug themselves in a hole. I say it over and over again. They're bogged down in Ukraine and they've dug themselves in a hole and they can't get out of it. The only way they can get out of this situation at this moment in time is either if they have very skilled diplomats, which they don't, hmm. or if they continue on this path towards conflict with Russia and China, because everywhere else in the world, they're losing the, the, Middle East, the Middle East is slipping away. Saudi Arabia is slipping away. South America is slipping away. Africa is slipping away. And, and the only way that they can get back to a unipolar world is if they go after the two countries, which are leading the global South out of the unipolar world. That's, that's the situation they're in right now. And, and to, to me, it's, it, it's clear that the only path forward for them because they don't have the, the skilled diplomats, the skilled leadership to turn this thing around. The only way forward for them is, is conflict. You know, everything is, is a nail and they're the hammer. That's the way they see it, unfortunately. You know, there was, there was denials, Cyrus, uh, about um, NATO forces on the grounds in uh, Ukraine, and that uh, little lie uh, was brought <laughs> very well exposed in these Pentagon documents here that uh, indeed there are, um, you know, other countries involved, uh, soldiers on the ground, Western special forces. Um, the document includes a list of countries which have small uh, contingents of military special forces operating inside Ukraine. United Kingdom sent a large number of soldiers, Latvia, France, United States, the Netherlands, and the United States Special Forces were detailed to the U.S. Embassy in Kiev to provide securities for VIP to assist oversight U.S. equipment supplies being sent to Ukraine. And probably 
to help with the banker boxes uh, for Alinsky to take his money safely out of the country and fly it to his eventual retirement uh, location. Cyrus, once again, you're the ambassador of peace. Where are we going with this, man? I mean, are we going to be able to get out of this mess? Well, I really like the point that Alex put is, you know, we, we just don't have the, dip, we don't have good diplomacy. You know, I mean, that, that's one of our, the, the biggest problem with American foreign policy is that we, we, we always come to the table, you know, too arrogant. We always are looking at it from our perspective only. And I mean, I remember just going back to when I first started, you know, my YouTube channel and, you know, we had then Secretary of State Michael Pompeo, who thankfully, by the way, just announced he will not be running for president in 2024. Um, you know, I think that's a big win for the world. But, uh, you know, it was interesting because, you know, his policy, you know, he would go around the world and he's like, the best policy for your country is America first. Always do what's in our best interest. You're going to work out. You're, you're going to be fine. Just make sure that you follow us. And and there's and that, and that I mean, this is we talk about why. Why is China winning in Saudi Arabia? Why are they winning in Africa? Why are they winning in Latin America? Now, in the last couple of months, I've done a lot of videos on the Belt and Road Initiative and, and examining these questions. We see the continuous pattern just coming up and up again. And it's always that the United States comes in. They never listen to what the actual people want done or, or, or even the local perspective. We, quite frankly, we don't give a crap about what the locals think. You know, it's again, it's our way or the highway. And it's just this aggressive nature of the United States. That's why Africa is all choosing to work with China. Because when the United States comes in, we look at Africa as one place. It's like, hey, this is this is the continent of Africa. You guys should do this. And Africa is saying, well, guess what? We're a continent of 54 countries. We all have individual needs and wants. And China is saying, well, we're going to listen to all 54 of you. We're going to listen to whatever each, you know, because every country has a different you know, a different need, a different, you know, needs to be dealt differently. And and we're going to give you that respect and we're going to listen to you. And this is why countries are moving, moving away. And I think this is just, um, yeah, I mean, this, this entire stream is really dedicated to this, the, you know, the future, which is, which I love this comments from the Indian ambassador, the former Indian, Indian ambassador to Russia, who said multipolarity you know, it's not a matter of if, but when it will, it will happen, right? It, it's, it is going to happen. It is going to be the future of our world. So yeah, Alex, I don't, I mean, it's, it's, it's also, uh, it's an interesting one. I mean, I don't think this is going as well for the United States. I mean, they, they would, they would like, they, I think, I'm sure they would have thought they could have defeated Russia a lot faster, but I mean, that is revealing that the, the foreign reserves, right? It was, it was at, the, at the beginning of the war was 630 billion now, you know, the gold and foreign reserves is at 600. I mean, they're basically almost back to where they started. I mean, that is uh, not a good sign. Yeah. If you're um, in the Alex, United States and trying to take them down, yeah. that's what I mean. Alex Christoforu, um, another uh, question. I keep going back to you because, um, well, once again, here's how my day starts. I get an update or an alert from Alex Christoforu. Then I move middle of the day. Alexander Mercurius comes in. Cyrus, I get pinged about every two or three days, a video coming from the ambassador of peace <laughs> over there. And then I eventually try to find some time to put my own videos up as well. But uh, I have to commend you gentlemen once again for really giving clarity to what is happening in uh, geopolitics in this world here. I mean, uh, without your voices, uh, extremely important, uh, Cyrus and Alex and Alexander, uh, really, it really means a lot, not just to me, but to also our viewers, a lot of our viewers that have now, uh, hopefully, uh, all of us have shared subscribers throughout our channel and really kind of growing. I, I remember my first time on the Duran show. Um, boy, that was uh, kind of stepping into a, quite an interesting live chat for me. Uh, I, I ended up reading a lot of the comments for the first uh, couple of days after that. And uh, there was a, a lot of um, real um, people interested in China. Uh, but at the start, kind of saying, eh, nothing's really going to happen with China and nothing's going to go on with China. Uh, why are we bring this guy on here? And it's interesting how this world evolves and pushes, you know, some of these channels and we move and we kind of move around these things. I remember three years ago when I started or four years ago when I started this channel, uh, it really didn't have much to do with China. Uh, and I remember watching you guys at a very early stage as well. But, I mean, we are actually, I mean, these channels are being pushed closer together because we're both really covering some incredibly important details. I mean, um, 
Alexander, uh, you've uh, you've been to uh, China before. I mean, uh, your th your thoughts uh, when people ask you uh, or when you talk about China to some people or even, uh, you know, the current geopolitical events, how, how is your audience? Uh, how do they feel about, you know, the potential of maybe some conflict in China? It, it, it depends very much about with whom you speak to. If you speak to people in Britain who are not part of the political elite, well, they are absolutely open to hearing what you want to say about what you say about China, about one's experiences there, about the fact that Shanghai, for example, which is the city I visited, is an extraordinary, thriving, bustling metropolis that the, you know, the economic expansion has been remarkable, that the living standards in China are completely different from what people in the West, most people in the West, believe, and that, you know, the the sheer scale of the economic achievement is stunning. And also the fact that most people that I met in China, you know, I've met quite a lot of people at many different levels. And if I say so myself, I'm usually good at speaking to people, even through interpreters. There was a friend of mine who was interpreting. Um, they like their government. I mean, they, they like and trust and support their government in China. Now, when you say that to, as I say, people who are not elite people, they understand that. If you say that to elite people, they do not want to see it. In fact, a friend of mine recently had, who, who actually is a China specialist, and has been extremely concerned about the whole direction of Western policy towards China, um, he was due to speak at a British university. He was going to go up against a prominent British member of parliament. I'm not going to name names. They're people you've all have heard of. The member of parliament found out that he was going to be speaking. He complained to the university and the entire thing was cancelled because this member mm -hmm. of parliament is very, very anti-Chinese. He doesn't want anti-Chinese. He, uh, he, what he would see is pro-Chinese voices to find any kind of expression or engage in any kind of debate. I was shocked when I heard about that, by the way, but it is happening increasingly. And if you're talking about elite level, people do not know very much about China. And I, this is a point they to understand. They don't know how Chinese political system works. They don't understand how decision making is made in China. They have only the vaguest ideas of Chinese industrial capacity. And I have experience in industrial matters. And I could sort of just get a very, even from the brief time was there, I get a brief sense of this. They have very little understanding of technology. They assume that all technology somehow, on principle, belongs to the West, that other, other countries cannot somehow reproduce or surpass the West in technology. So they imagine a China that is both much more nefarious than it actually is about. I don't think it's nefarious, but they imagine it. They want to believe in its, you know, nefariousness. And at the same time, and this is perhaps the most dangerous thing, at some level, they believe that it is much weaker than it really is. They made that same miscalculation about Russia. I've been telling people about this for Years and years and years I've been trying to explain Russia is not a gas station masquerading as a country. It's a real place. There are real people. The Russian economy is a reality. With China, I come across the same problem, though it is even more dangerous, given that the scales in between China and Russia are so much greater. I mean, the idea that you can take on the Chinese colossus, which doesn't want to come after you. Let me repeat that again. But you could take on the Chinese <laughs> Colossus when your weapons are being depleted, fighting a proxy war in Ukraine against the Russians. you have so short of 155 million beta shells that you have to go cap in hand and borrow shells from South Korea. Borrow shells from South Korea. You can't... You can only patch together about 250 tanks to send to Ukraine. And that's taking on the Russians. 
that you're going to, with all of that, take on China as well, or or in place of the you uh, you know Russia. Well, you are living in a completely delusional world if that is what you think. But unfortunately, as I said, there are many West, many Western leaders who do, and they don't want to see. Uh, they don't want to see beyond it. Yeah, I agree with you on that point, uh, Alexander. I mean, they are going cap in hand to try to, you know, build up and beef up the Ukrainian. I mean, they could head over to uh, Serbia and pick up a lot of the depleted uranium that they left there after that 78 days of aerial bombardment down there. Um, Alex Christoforou, um, another question for you. Um, you've really been following this from day one. Uh, this Ukraine uh, and Russia conflict. Um, do you think there is going to be this so talked about offensive that's coming from the Ukraine? Do you do you see it? I mean, look, I think they don't have much of a choice at this point. Whatever this offensive is going to be, I don't know in what form, in which direction this offensive is going to take place. Who knows how big it's going to be, but... You know, they've talked it up so much that I imagine they, they have to go through with it. But more importantly, I think it's the the, the, the core group of neocons in the Biden White House, uh, Sullivan, Blinken, Newland, that are pushing Ukraine to do this. I think there are forces in Ukraine that don't want to do this spring offensive. There are definitely forces in the Pentagon uh, and the intel community that believe this is a bad idea. It doesn't mean they don't want to continue this conflict. It doesn't mean they don't want to want to find a way to, to cause regime change in Russia. It just means that there are forces in the collective West that believe a spring offensive at this moment in time is a bad idea and it's going to fail. Saying that, Ukraine doesn't have much time. And everyone knows that. The Russians continue to produce weapons. They're not running out of missiles. They're not running out, out of ammunition. Ukraine, the collective West, they can't produce ammunition. They can't produce the, the, the missiles at the pace that Russia is producing. The Ukraine economy is, is, is being held together by, by scotch tape and glue and toothpicks. They know that time is running out. And the collective West, they understand that they have to strike a decisive blow to Russia in one form or another so that they can move on to China. So time is working against the collective West. Time is on. Russia's side, time is on China's side. So I think they're, they're going to have to do something. Now, this could be a big offensive. I don't know. This could be a very big offensive. This may be a nothing offensive. It may be in multiple directions. I've heard a date of, from the leaked documents. I think I read today that the leaked documents claim that this offensive is going to take place on April 30th. I, I think the New York Times reported on this or, or the Financial yeah, Times said here. April 30th. You're um, right. Yeah, there are other publications that say in the middle yeah. of May. Exactly. So we're going to get something. My, my belief is we're going to get something. It could be something big. It could be something not so big, but uh, it has to be done. And uh, the, the, the big question to me is if this is a big offensive and it does give Ukraine what it needed, which was territorial gain all the way up to the borders of Crimea, at a huge loss to their own milita military, then what? What comes next? What do you do then? <sighs> I, I think mean, that's, that's the important question to ask. And, and I'm saying if, if Ukraine manages to, to make inroads to reach the border of Crimea, then what happens? Yeah, you know, Alex, why is no one really asking that question? Like, do they really think... Uh, before I got on the show today, I was reading how many nuclear warheads were in in Russia. I mean, what do they think? They're okay. We're let's do an offensive. Let's uh, blow up a few more tanks. Let's uh, get some territory back. It's not going to well, end. It's 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 the hope strategy. It's it's the hope strategy that if they get to the border of Crimea, some sort of palace intrigue in Russia will lead to some sort of regime change. There was well, a UK I, I, general of uh, Alexander may know his name. He wrote an article in uh, in the Telegraph, and and you know he was talking about the Julius Caesar moment for Putin. Okay, 
You know, it's kind of clownish to read articles like that, but there's a lot of truth in there as well in that their hope is that they'll do enough damage to Russia so that someone somewhere says, okay, Putin is not fighting this war well. Uh, we've been humiliated. He needs to go. That's, that's kind of what they're hoping for. <laughs> Interesting. Uh, gentlemen, we're going to end the show on this last topic here. Um, and Cyrus, I'm going to lead with you because you've done a lot of videos on this, the BRICS and the de-dollarization. We're going to go with Cyrus first, Alexander McCurra second, Alex Christoforu third, and then uh, we'll wrap it up. Uh, Cyrus, over to you, the ambassador of peace. If we're talking about Belt and Road and, and bricks, I mean, again, it's it's just, uh, I love the quote from the, the former Indian uh, ambassador to Russia. I mean, multipolarity will happen. It's going to happen in the future. And and, and I also, I really like what Alexander brought up before as well when, uh, you know, when I mentioned the fact that, um, you know, America said, you know, this opinion piece in New York Times said, you know, the best way to, to fight China would be to focus on America. Now, I, I want to just kind of... Uh, basically uh, comment on that because it's not I agree with Alexander's point you don't you don't want to improve America to counter China it's more you want to improve America because that's what you should be doing for your country I, I can't agree more that's a big point that's a big point that I make constantly on my channel is that the United States has to you know but but again we need to focus on improving our lives for our citizens here but again when we have that military industrial complex it's really hard to because there's just too much money. There's too much corruption involved in politics. I mean, we talk about corruption. I mean, the United States government and I mean, corruption exists on every level in every form of government around the world. I mean, but we are just so good at it. I mean, we really are. I mean, we, 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 we kind of sell this thing of democracy and freedom, and this is the most amazing government in the world. But there's a lot of shady stuff that happens. And it, it, the, the reality is, is that most Americans just have no idea what's going on. And they don't really care because we just live in this little bubble here in America. And it really is interesting uh, because when I, what, I've, what I've found since I've moved back to the United States is I spent a lot of time talking to Americans on the ground. And I tell people, you know, look, this is why this is why people are choosing to work with China, right? This is why Latin America, the majority of Latin American countries are now moving towards China. And in the, we just have to we just have to um, prepare for this multipolarity, because if you're a smaller country as well, if you're Bolivia, for example, why would you want to trade exclusively with the United States? And it's in your best interest to trade with the United States and with China. And we see that with um, you know, countless of small countries and smaller developing countries. And essentially, this is why the global south is getting behind, uh, you know, China and they are wanting to, you know, transact and, you know, they're going to, you know, the digital renminbi. I mean, China is the absolute world leader in this technology. They are going, you know, the digital renminbi is going to be very vital in the few, next few years. Uh, we are going to see more and more people choosing to transact in different currencies. We've already seen Saudi Arabia. I mean, our closest, the United States' closest ally come out and said, look, we're done. We're done trying to please you. You know, we, honestly, we just don't give a crap anymore. You know, we're not going to just try to do everything to teach you. We're going to do what's in our best interest. Same thing with France, same thing with Africa. I mean, it's it's just it's becoming it's becoming very worrisome for these neocons, uh, as Alex puts it. And I agree with him on that. And these and, and, and these neocons that are running the United States government. But it's something that Americans need to accept. And it's fine because, again, it's you know, again, like, like we went back to Alexander's comments about Rubio. What's the big deal? If, if Brazil wants to transact with Russia or with with China in a different currency, go for it. Who cares? I mean, you know, and what it does is it makes us appear, appear so weak because we're so concerned about that. Um, you know, it, and again, that's that's where we get into this problem with the United States is that we are so concerned with trying to contain China and to stop them. We 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 don't grow as a result. And, and the last point I'm going to make is I made a video detailing Africa's Belt and Road Initiative and why Africa chose. This is the interesting thing. If you go back 23 years ago, around 2000, the United States dominated trade with Africa. Okay, but China was basically non-existent, you know, th three decades ago. Now, when China went in, did it, was there was their goal to say, how do we stop the United States efforts in Africa? How do we contain America? No, China went in and said, hey, you guys got your share. We're going to come and get our share. Fast forward to today. China's trade now is five times that of the United States. So again, you look at China's policies, their strategy is never to contain America, nor is it to stop. You know, they're even saying, hey, you, you know, you want to trade with America? Go for it. 
We're just going to give you another option. And guess what? A lot of people are choosing it. That's the future of our world. Thank you, guys. Uh, Alexander McCurris. Yeah, I just wanted to take up from what Cyrus was just saying there, because, of course, Lula has just made some comments, and he said Brazil doesn't want to choose. But we put in a position where it's asked to choose between China and the United States. We want to have good relations with both. And that's something the Chinese are clever enough and perhaps realistic enough to say that's absolutely fine. It is people like Rubio who are coming along and telling Brazil that you're either with us or you're against us. If you're not with us on China, then you are against us. And people, countries, big countries like Brazil don't want to be ordered around in that kind of a way. It just puts people people's backs up and makes them angry and resentful. They don't like be bullied. We go back to the point that Cyrus was making about how the United States no longer knows how to conduct diplomacy. What the United States does, always it, it lectures, it threatens. We had a visit by the CIA director to Riyadh, to Saudi Arabia, in which the director said to the Saudis, look, we're frustrated about your policy with the Iran. It's a straightforward threat, because if it's delivered by the CIA director, how else are the Saudis going to construe it? And people don't like being threatened. They don't like being bullied. They far better prefer to deal with the country that, on the contrary, takes them and treats them with respect, listens to what they have to say, tries to work with them. Now, I just wanted to make two further points. Firstly, about the these programs, these statements we've been hearing from the United States, that three-hour session with Lloyd Austin. Um, the thing that is absolutely dismaying is that there are no voices of restraint any longer in the United States. And one gets the sense that people are working each other up. Everybody's competing with everybody else to be as, you know, as aggressive as they can to outbid each other in aggression. And one also senses that anybody who deep down might have any concerns might be a bit worried about the direction in which things are going is too frightened in this kind of atmosphere to speak out and to speak out against it. If that is so, then all I can say is um, that they absolutely do need to speak out because it is essential that alternatives are presented in the United States. And there are alternatives, there are options. There is the option that that and the, the Indian ambassador was talking about moving towards a negotiated multipolarity. Were that to happen, we would have peace and there would be a good future for the United States and its people as well. Um, we'll say goodbye to Cyrus. He's heading out. Um, he's getting ready for his day there in America. Thank you, Cyrus. Uh, we'll just pull your mic off and mute there if you could. Yeah, sorry. And uh, say goodbye to the audience. Perfect. Your Everybody, audience. thank you so much for joining. I was got a, I got a dash. Kids are getting ready for school and everything. Uh, Alexander, Alex, thank you so much. And other Alex, all three of you. Uh, thank you so much <laughs> for a great stream. I look forward to doing more of it, gentlemen. And I'll keep my channel going. If you're watching on my channel, Perfect. keep it going. These guys will bring us home. Thank you very much, Cyrus. Um, going over to uh, Alex Christopher. Or did you finish, uh, Alexander? Did you finish? Yes, I finished. You're, Absolutely. Okay. That, that was what I wanted so, to say, that there are alternatives. I just wanted to stress again, we don't need to have this path to war. We might very well find that we're, you know, we're bogged down and locked ourselves into it. But if so, and I just say, say we, because you know, in Britain we are part of this runaway train, that unfortunately mm -hmm. will be our choice. We can always choose not to do this. Unfortunately, nobody is speaking out and saying that we shouldn't. And that's great. That, that, that is a tragedy. Great comment, runaway train. Um, you know, as I was saying this week, you know, China builds bridges while America build, builds bases. And that is the, you know, the, the climate that we're in here. Um, you know, you know, China is building these relations. And what I'm getting from you guys is, is the U.S. is inflicting these sanctions. And this just 
as you guys said, I've used your quote, I think, once or twice this week in an interview about the um, sanctions escalator. I mean, you guys have nailed it since day one on it. And um, I'm going to go back to Christopher because, once again, your voice is extremely important because just about, I'm going to say, almost 100% of the time, anything that comes out of your mouth eventually happens. It's a you must have an amazing crystal ball there or really knowledgeable in what you're doing. And I would say uh, probably very knowledgeable in what you're doing there, uh, Alex. So tell us, what are we in for here over the next few weeks? And uh, your thoughts again on the uh, BRICS and the de-dollarization. Maybe you can kind of pack it together. Uh, what we're in for, I think everyone is waiting for the, for the offensive. So we're just going to wait and see. We've got these document leaks, which are now being used by, by the Biden White House to increase their, their surveillance and control of the internet. So I think that's, that's where we're heading with that. And going off of what Alexander said, he's, uh, he's 100% right. In a multipolar world, everyone will be more prosperous and more happy, including the people of the United States of America. Uh, for this, there's no doubt, but... We have to go back in history and not too far back. We have to go back to 2014 to understand that it's not about choice. It's not about giving countries a choice as to who they want to trade with, what currencies they want to trade in, who they would like to partner with. That's not what this is about because in 2014, when the Maidan coup was going down, Russia said to uh, Yanukovych, and they said to Ukraine, and they said to the European Union, they said, it's okay if Ukraine wants to trade with the EU. It's okay even if Ukraine wants to move towards a path towards the European Union. For us, what concerns us is NATO because it's, it's an issue of security. We can't have NATO move closer and closer to our borders, and we cannot have NATO camp right in Ukraine. We can't have that. So for them, it was a red line. It was a, it was a national security issue. They said to Yanukovych, to the European Union, to John McCain, who was giving speeches at the Maidan, Ukraine can move towards the West. They can trade with the West. They can trade with us, and they will be better for it. They will be a bridge. They will be more prosperous. It's crazy to decouple Ukraine's economy from Russia's economy because Ukraine's economy was geared towards Russia's economy. And at the end of the day, you're looking at a big neighbor and it would be beneficial for Ukraine to trade and do business with that big neighbor. But it wasn't about choice because what the European Union did, what uh, McCain, who was chief of the neocons at the time did, what they did is they said, look, no, no. There is no choice. It's either us or nobody. And we know what happened. So are we going to repeat ourselves with, with every other country going forward? Yes, as long as this, this group of individuals is running the show in the US government, yes, this is going to be repeated over and over again. And, and that's, that's the heart of, uh, of the problem. And it's going to be repeated in Taiwan, and it's going to be repeated with, with trade and the dollar, and it's going to be repeated in Sudan, and it's going to be repeated in Africa and South America until we eventually get to a multipolar world by, by just sheer momentum, by force. Yeah, wow. I mean, 36 countries bombed since World War II, uh, heavily financed Maidan movement. I remember watching that in 2014. Very colorful posters, probably four or five hundred dollars a piece. Everyone had one in the crowds there. I don't know where they got the money to print those. And all those people that stayed in the cent city center for months, massively financed. And well, John McCain is no longer with us. Lindsey Graham, the neocon, is living uh, very well in America, and he is the poster boy for promoting this Ukraine war and arms. That is for certain. Uh, once again, for all the viewers that have been watching the program today, please subscribe to these channels. Alexander McCurris, Alexander Christopher, the Duran, 
you will not get news any better on the geopolitical landscape that is going on, I would say, in the world today. No doubt you have to uh, click on those subscribe buttons once we finish this show. Uh, we're going to wrap it up, gentlemen. Thank you so much. And we may have some uh, interesting news here in the future with some guests. And, of course, the first call that we're going to make to uh, invite people back to join us is uh, these fine gentlemen. Thank you so much for spending time in your busy schedule and helping educate people uh, to really get cut through uh, a lot of the stuff the mainstream media doesn't. Anyway, once again, gentlemen, thank you very much for spending a little bit of over an hour with us uh, here today. And you guys have yourself a great week. Take care.